Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome back to day three, the final day. Again, uh, the final day of what's been, uh, for me, a fantastic learning experience. Hopefully, you're learning a lot, too. Uh, don't forget, a lot of this is about being aware and being educated. We've had some great guests uh, that have helped you think about their process. I'm obviously back and forth trying to always improve my process, and I think it is super important to have a process. That's that, that's the heart of the matter if you're going to engage in risk managing markets. So, uh, with that, I'd like to welcome for the first time on on Hedge ITV. It's been a long, long time coming. Grant Williams, welcome uh, and thanks for making the time with us. Keith, hey, great pleasure. You, you and I were supposed to do this in person, so it's a great shame that that hasn't happened. But this is this is a close second. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where where are you at today, by the way? Uh, I'm in the Cayman Islands under total lockdown. They've closed everything, including the beach down here. So it's uh, it's it's full lockdown. It's kind of strange times, really strange. Yeah, yeah that, that would be an understatement. Uh, but don't worry, Grant, the, uh, the, the new bull market is back in case you haven't heard about that. And uh, if you've had a panic attack in the Caymans or in Stanford, Connecticut, for that matter, trying to call V bottoms or uh, you know, just going back, I guess everybody, everybody just wants to go back. Everybody wants to go back to where we were two months ago. You know, it, it's it's amazing, right? The data's coming out, and we had more data today. And and the misses to the downside on these numbers, yeah. uh, whether it's the New York Fed, the Philly Fed, or it's unemployment, initial claims, uh, continuing claims, whatever it may be, the misses to the downside are enormous, uh, even with people putting up supposedly apocalyptic scenarios. And yet, these are the same people who are saying, V-bounce, we're going to be back to where we were back to all-time highs, you know, if you're that far out on the downside, uh, people are so happy to believe this positive scenario that everything is going to bounce back and, and, and be okay. And, you know, look, maybe it is, right? But I think what you said at the beginning there is so true. It's about being aware and it's about having a plan for what if it doesn't? What mm -hmm. if this is not a V-shaped recovery? Because if it isn't, then it's not going to muddle along. It's going to be chaos. In many regards, it's predictable. I mean, it's it's a linear assumption based on the current reality. So the V goes one way, and uh, as anybody who's uh, drawn a V before can see that it's it's linear. Uh, so <laughs> how do you think? And, and this is one of your main points. And, and this is clearly you know when when you found success with things that make you go hmm. You know, this this is your uh, your your writing style, um, but your thinking style. How do you think? Like, uh, how do you think from a nonlinear perspective? And how do you think in an environment like this? Do you know, I, I think the single biggest uh, problem people have and, and the way the world around us is going at the moment has, is really contributing to that and exacerbating it is people have an unwillingness to entertain extreme outcomes. Mm -hmm. And people think that if you entertain an extreme outcome, you're a, you're a freak or a lunatic. Um, and so they say, well, well, that will never happen. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if you just said we'll get 32% unemployment in the U.S. in six months at the tail end of the last year, people would have said, don't be ridiculous. But there would have been people who said, well, let me think that through. Maybe it's a pandemic. Maybe they figured out what it was. But, but let's think that through and what happens. And once I figure out what that might look like, okay, then let me sign, uh, assign a risk probability to it. Do I think it's likely? No, it's clearly a massive outlier. But is the chance zero? If the chance isn't zero, what steps do I have to take? So just having an open mind and being willing to entertain outcomes that seem unlikely and also to entertain the kind of outcomes that other people are suggesting is, to me, perhaps the most important starting point for everybody. And yet today, as the world evolves around us, and COVID-19, unfortunately, has been a perfect example of that because we split so quickly into the just the flu crowd and the deadliest killer ever crowd. And no one will listen to the people on the other side. You know, I, I was talking to a good friend of mine in Singapore, Steve Diggle, the other night. And he, he said, look, I, I've stopped reading the news because every other headline has the word could or may or might in it. You know, COVID could kill 2 million people. Mm -hmm. COVID may be the biggest killer since. I just try and look at the data. And, and yet, even when you find the data now, you've got to try and strip out the politicizing of the data and the, and the opinion around that data. And so it's become really, really difficult to be a truly independent thinker. And, mm -hmm. and that, I think, is a kind of shorter way to get back from a long answer to your question. Well, I mean, uh, being an independent thinker has always been difficult, but it's been quite profitable. And it's and, and from my perspective, it's just a better way to live. Uh, but uh, you know, yeah. to, to, to wake up every morning, I mean, and I mean this uh, quite seriously and, and sadly in many ways, I feel it saddens me to think of that life 
where you have to wake up looking for your political bias or your market bias, your marketing bias. You know, the, I just rattled off the entire edifice of the officialdom that is. I mean, that that is such yeah. a tough. I mean, I feel I feel I actually, and I'm I'm not, you know, trying to um, say anything other than what I just said. It is a sad way to to live one's life. I mean, I, I what do you make of that? Well, look, I, I think it's okay. We all have to understand that we all have biases, right? We're human beings. We have biases. So, so understand that you have a bias, and that's fine, right? Because without a bias, you have no opinions, you have nothing, right? So you have to have a bias. But be willing to test it all the time. Every morning when you wake up, read. If, you, if you're, uh, you know, if in the UK, I, I'll catch it in UK terms. If you're a Telegraph reader, read The Guardian. <laughs> if you're a Guardian reader, read The Telegraph. Read the other side of the argument. Read the stuff that doesn't confirm your biases and try not to just dismiss it out of hand. Right. But, you, but you're right, I mean, but that's where we are, right? We do wake up every morning and try and figure out, okay, here I'm reading an article in the New York Times or the Washington Post, and I'm picking them at random. What lens is this coming at me through? Mm -hmm. And instantly you kind of think to yourself, oh, I know where this is coming from. So you kind of read it and you instantly dismiss it because it comes from a certain outlet. And it's really, really difficult. And the more noise there is, the harder the signal gets to find. But, you know, the, the stuff you're doing and trying to, trying to help people find that signal is, is so important. Well, that, I mean, the basis of, uh, you're one of the founders of Real Vision, of course, and the basis of Hedge Eye is just that. I mean, we have human biases, I get that, but to wake up in the morning looking for that answer is quite different than having biases in terms of your actual market positions uh, and, yeah. try, and, and, try, and trying to get, get it right. Uh, and Mike Taylor did a great job. I don't know if you saw that uh, discussion that I had uh, earlier in the week. Yeah. People, people were kind of like freaked out about it. They're like, who is this yeah. guy? I mean, who, who, how, is that how a hedge fund manager really thinks? He, ha he, he thinks about not being right, but making money? I mean, this is an amazing thing yeah. for some people to watch because the, you know, the narrative or the bias, you know, that is CNBC or the other channels, if you will, uh, really hasn't taught people that. They haven't taught people how to buy bonds. They haven't taught people how to do anything. Um, so I, I really do think it is a new dawn in, in all crises. Uh, that is indeed the case. Uh, and I don't think this time will be different. If anything, I think it's going to pick up the pace of innovation and, and, um, and change. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think this will be um, a, an era defining period. Um, and, and at this point, to me, whichever way this goes, I think a lot of things are going to change. I think behavior will change. Uh, I think the way people look at themselves, the way they look at uh, their kind of immediate groups, their broader groups, they're going to look at uh, where they got information from in this that helped them, where it was sensationalized. And, and people will take stock and they will, having hunkered down for, for, in some cases, I think what it looked like months on end, I think it will change behavior. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I was reading something uh, written by Charles Garve the other day, who's you know a brilliant thinker. And he was positing a question about what would happen if this pandemic went away in five or six weeks, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. let's, say let's say the outlier, we talk about those extreme outcomes. Let's say the, the pandemic vanishes the same way it came in five or six weeks, burns itself out, whatever. What happens then, right? Because the, 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 the stimulus that's been applied to the economy is out. You're not going to go and ask people to send their $1,200 checks back, right? Uh, the money's out there. It's going to go into the economy. People are immediately going to be not only less fearful, but not the, the, the fear that caught them is not going to stay inside them as long, right? So they'll get over it quicker. They'll, they'll be happy to spend that money. They won't be as frightened. And so if that happens, what happens? The bond market melts down, at which point the central banks have to print more money to save that thing. You know, th this whole system has been built and engineered essentially over the last 25, 30 years to make sure asset prices go up. Mm -hmm. And if things are changing, then you have to rethink what that means for every facet of your portfolio, for every facet of your life, for every facet of the economic system. And if everything is going to change, we're going from a, an era of declining and low volatility. If that changes, it means the opposite. We've had a prolonged period of deflation. If that changes, you have to think about inflation. We've had a period where central banks have been able to get every result they've desired. You have to think about that changing. And that changes a lot of things. So whatever happens now, whether the virus is with us for a long time and it completely changes the way people view their place within the world, or it goes away and we have to deal with the outcome of what Charles beautifully described as a mimetic panic, 
when all the central bankers just ran around screaming and shouting and throwing money at this problem immediately, um, it's going to cause problems. So people need to really start thinking and, and, and you know, listening to the kind of stuff you put out and the stuff that Real Vision tries to put out. Just having access to people who do think these things through and listening is the, is the first and I think most crucial step at this point. Because mm -hmm. none of us know, right? We don't know any of this. The outcome is completely undetermined. No, I mean, every, every morning, God willing, two feet on the floor, I wake up um, like, any, like any good Irishman, say, say, say my Catholic prayer, and I, and I accept and, and I embrace uncertainty. I have no fucking idea what's going to happen. I mean, I, I just right. take, take one step forward. And, and, and again, it's an amazing thing to watch. Uh, somebody who's legendary and I have a tremendous amount of respect for, uh, Ray Dalio, for example. He's gotten his ass kicked this year, uh, which surprised me, uh, first of all, because we have at least my four quadrant model is similar to his model. I mean, yep. um, he's got a lot more people than I than I have. So I would have thought that he would have been on top of the data a little 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 bit more on top is the way that I would think. Yeah. But what, then I listen to him and I read him and, and he's talking about being a globalist and it's like an idealist. And, and I'm like, man, that is way too, I'm not an intellectual. So clearly that's well above my pay grade. But I wonder what the hell's going on with the stuff like that? Well, look, I mean, Delio is a perfect example, right? Delio is a guy who recently was out very vocally talking about how cash was trash, right? Right. That, that was his first. Cash is trash. That, that shocked me. And, I mean, I was actually quite yeah. scared because I had the opposite position. <laughs> I, I, no, I completely agree. But but if you strip that back, right, I mean, here's a guy, Dalio, who is a very smart guy, but he's had status and prestige bestowed upon him by his position, by the amount of money he manages, by how successful his hedge fund has been, right? And what we tend to do in crises like this is we go and we want to talk to famous people. We want to talk to people who are familiar, who are voices that people recognize. It doesn't guarantee the quality of their thinking. And so when you hear someone um, who is as smart as Dalio is say something like cash is trash, at no point, if you are a prudent investor, is that statement true? At no point. You always need some kind of reserve. You need some kind of buffer for a pandemic that comes out of the clear blue sky. So, you know, I, I think a lot of people have been caught out by this. A lot of people have been inured to markets going up, to buying the dip, to V bottoms, to green shoes, to all these things that we've, we've, we've seen happen time and time again without looking at the invisible hand that has ensured they happen too closely. And, and it's really only um, guys like us who are, who spend our lives immersed in financial markets, who look at what's going on and look at what central banks have done and call them out on it. There is nobody who doesn't understand and spend their life involved in finance, who's running a corner shop, who's, who's you know, running a, a car wash, who's saying, man, those central banks are out there printing all this money. What the hell's going to happen? They're just not doing it. What they're looking at is we need help and we need help fast. And what's happening, you know, we, we saw today the, the small business uh, loans, the $350 billion has gone. Right, that's run out. The, 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 this website's accepting no more uh, applications. The same day, or rather yesterday, we had a, we had a, a bill tabled that would pay every qualifying American above the age of 16 two thousand dollars a month until employment reached what got back to pre-COVID levels. That is literally a blank check, right? Um, so all this stuff is happening, but while the Small Business Administration is struggling to find more money to give to small businesses, the Fed are out buying junk bonds. Right now, you and I understand how absolutely disgusting that is. What a disgrace that program is for Main Street. Main Street kind of has this feeling they should be angry about something and they're kind of pissed at when they hear the word bailouts because they never feel like the bailout applies to them. And, and most of the time it doesn't. But they don't understand just how incredibly annoyed they should be about what the Fed is doing. Give that money to Main Street, screw Wall Street. You know, Chamath was on um, was on CNBC in a clip that went viral the other day. And why? Because he said, you know what? Let some of these hedge funds fail. You, you bought the equity. You, when you bought it, the rules are you get wiped out if it goes under. Airlines have gone bankrupt all the time, right? And they still fly. The equity goes to zero. That is perfectly acceptable. But there is this there is this need and this 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 habit that we've gotten into of bailing out Wall Street, uh, getting asset prices to go up at the expense of Main Street. And, and if this doesn't stop that, if this crisis now doesn't stop that, 
then I mean, I, I despair because people really need to be angry and pissed off and get something done about this. Well, I, Sorry, that's, that's I, my rant, that's I, my rant I, over. No, I, I like that rant, and it's not really a rant. It's, it's actually uh, part of what I've been told is is a chorus, uh, and I've been told this from yeah. um, people uh, on the buy side, don't forget. Uh, there are two communities on the buy side, those that are also more like the people that, like you said, should and and will be pissed once they, once they figure it out. And, 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 and there's the people that are taking advantage of it because they got the look-see, you know, they, they're like, ha ha, I'm going to buy these junk bonds because I know this is coming. Keith, you're an yep. idiot. Um, you know, it's stuff like that. But I mean, it really, it, it, that, that part of the buy side discussion genuinely disgusts me. Um, but, but, but what well, well, it, well, there's, there's, there's a, there's a, there is a distinction there, right? And, and, and we have to be a little bit careful because th this, is, this is a game that we're all investing and we're all playing by a set of rules, right? And yes, mm -hmm. they change the rules mid game. But if, if someone's running a hedge fund and it's his job to make money in the junk bond market, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's conceivable how someone can be outraged at what they're doing and yet buying junk bonds because that's their job and that's exactly. what they're supposed to do. I get that. I get I, that. I, I get it. Yeah. It's a tough that's position the bias. to be in. That's the bias. The, the change needs to come from the top. Change needs yeah. to come from, from Washington. God forbid that never happen. Well, it, well, let's just start with the fact that all this came from the top. I mean, the top of the top in right. terms of right. leaders. And I, you know, my definition of leader is quite different. My father was a fire chief. I was a captain of a hockey team. That's not the kind of leadership that we provide. We provide truthful leadership, accountable leadership, transparent leadership. I don't need to get on and on and on with it. If we have to knock one of our players out, you know, one of our teammates, we might even do that too. Because uh, yeah. again, when you're trying to save lives in a burning building, or in my case, I really look at it this way, which is I want to make sure people save their net worth. They've worked hard for it. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to help them make good decisions with that net worth. Um, so the leaders, you know, have really like just you know watch Larry Fink today. I mean, I, I didn't watch the interview. I couldn't tell you what he was going to say anyway. Or Jamie Dimon. I mean, this is this is where this all comes from. Um, so we've effectively they've they've signed off on it happening. Isn't that the point? They panicked so quickly and made it happen so egregiously that now the lights are on. You know, the, we I needed that. Yeah. The lights are on. The rats are in the room. Like we got it. We, we it took a while. But I mean, compared to you know, Congress, didn't even the last time on TARP it was you know what seven eight hundred billion dollars. I mean that's not that much money anymore. Um, but they voted it down this time. Whammo! We're merging the Fed and the Treasury. We got two trillion here, eight trillion there. It's it's yeah. is the expediency of it all the catalyst to make it change? Look, it, it's done. Right, the Treasury, the Treasury, and the Fed have merged. Let's face it. To all intents and purposes, that's now done. Um, what was interesting in the CARES Act was the, the wording around what the Fed can do and how transparent they had to be. So they, they've removed transparency and made it, uh, made it okay for the Fed to not release publicly the decisions they make about this stuff. Right? And so that tells you that the people making these decisions understand just how important it is that the man in the street doesn't understand what they're doing. Yeah. Right. That's the first sign. So they're obviously worried about it, and they should be. Now, is this is this the crisis that makes people wake up? I, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. You you get that sense, you get that sense that that the outrage is is there, and I think if they if they don't find a lot more money for Main Street very fast, then the anger is going to rise very very quickly because people are out of a job, right? Millions of people have lost their jobs, and. Before in, in 2008, if you look at every, static, uh, every statistic, that was a V bottom, right? It did drop and it did bounce. And everything was done to optically make the unemployment numbers look as rosy as they could. Because if you can sell that narrative that, hey, the, the job market's bounced, for the people that don't have a job, at least they have hope that, you know what, other people are getting jobs, I'll get my job soon, right? Yep. So you, you have to maintain that and they have to keep doing that. But... People by the millions are out of work and they're bartenders and waiters and people who've put their life savings into, into small businesses and we're buying junk bonds. I mean, this if this doesn't solve the problem that you just articulated so beautifully, then I don't know how to help people help themselves, right? Because mm. this is pitchfork and torch time. It really is. Yeah. Well, that, that and I, I think you're familiar with my colleague, uh, Neil Howe, the demographer who's Absolutely, who, yeah. who wrote The Fourth Turning. Uh, we're right on the screws, by the way, when he wrote that book. 
Uh, he said, and, and again, this is really hard to do, and, 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 and to, to a degree, even Neil would probably say there's a little bit of luck, but he said by the year 2021, you would have the fourth turning, yeah. and that is a generational thing. You've written about a, a 40 year inching towards, I think you've said, inching towards a paradigm shift. Is that you know, part and parcel uh, talking a little bit about what Neil's talking about and the cultural revolution and the timing of it? Uh, absolutely. I, th I think financial systems have a finite lifespan, right? Because they all get characterized by the same things, greed and the excess debt leverage uh, get, that is allowed to build up leverage in the system. And that's where we are. Unfortunately, generally what tends to happen at the, at the, at the extreme limits of those financial systems is the pressure uh, and the valve for that pressure first starts getting felt in society. Um, and we've seen that, you know, I, I did a presentation um, just over a year ago called Cry Wolf, where I was, I was talking, again, this comes back to our first point about, about entertaining uh, outcomes that you don't think are likely. And, I, and I, I talked about a gold standard. And as soon as you start talking about a gold standard, people go, oh, gold standard, forget it, it'll never happen. <laughs> it, it won't work, forget it, it's, it's pointless, right? But the whole point of the presentation was to make people just think about it, just think this through. And, and the things that I laid out, I said, here's what you need for a gold standard to happen. And the important point is to realize that nobody chooses to go on a gold standard because it's very restrictive in terms of what politicians can promise and spend. You don't choose. So, no, it won't be a decision that gets made. It will be something that they have to go to to stabilize a system that's falling apart. What you need is political disorder. You need social disorder and you need uh, financial market chaos, right? We have social disorder. We've had that brewing for a number of years now. God knows we've got political disorder everywhere you look around the world. The conflict uh, between left and right going to extremes. We've got it between boomers and millennials. So the conflict is all there. The one thing that was missing was financial market chaos. And that is what we are threatened with right now. This is a very clear and present danger. And if we get that, if the financial markets do what it's it's eminently possible. And, and I would say likely that they do, unless a magic bullet can be found, then you have all the conditions in place for the end of a financial system and a transition to a new system. Now, what that might look like, ultimately, we don't know. But in the interim, there's one thing they can go back to that for 5,000 years has proven to be a stabilizing influence at the center of any kind of monetary system, and that's precious metals. Mm -hmm. And the more money that gets printed, the more uh, stimulus that gets applied, the more likely it is that gold is going to return to center stage at some point in our lifetimes. And that, I think, is what gold is starting to sniff out now. Yeah, that, that, that's big. I mean, and again, it's, it's you know, the politics of uh, an ounce of gold are interestingly uh, uninteresting. And so that's, that's, I think that's your point. You've also called it, I mean, when you said endgame, I've, 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 I've uh, at least uh, done some homework on, on, on your thoughts on some of these things, but you've talked about an end game to the super debt cycle. Is that all part of the same thing? Yeah, I, th I think the whole, th I think the monetary system is, is the anchor of all of it, right? Our society is built around the monetary system because without a functioning monetary system, society doesn't work. It, and, and that functioning monetary system is supposed to do all the things that we need from society. It's supposed to help capital get into the right hand. It's supposed to help labor get more prosperous. It's supposed to bring people up the prosperity chain. And it works every time this system works until it gets hijacked by corporate interests and greed and, and all the people who shouldn't have access to the spigots get them. And it happens time and time and time again. So that end game is ultimately the failure of a system because it ate itself. And if you look around now, anyone that looks at where we are, that looks at the debt levels, looks at how fragile this whole system is, you, 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 you have to understand that if this isn't the end of the road, as they say, you can see it from here. And so if you, if, you, if you can recognize that we have a fundamental fragility to the global financial system in which we've all lived our entire lives, so of course we have no experience really pre-1971 of what a, a, a tethered system looked like. If you recognize that it's creaking, if you recognize that throughout history, these things do reach an end, then again, back to our first point, you have to start entertaining extreme outcomes, which is, are we about to have a new financial system? And what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And there are many different what, things it could look like, but the first thing that will be needed is stability. And if you want something stability, uh, something stable, sorry, it's not a fiat currency, 
it's not you know, it's not something you can create out of thin air. It has to have some value, and and as we have seen, money is becoming valueless. Um, bonds are becoming valueless. The only bid is the Fed, and so you, you just need to think about this stuff. And, and you know, I I I've get labelled a gold bug all the time. Um, which kind of makes me laugh. I, I've, I've never been a table thumping gold bug. I, I recognise its place, <laughs> but but I, but I think I think now it's something that again, if you've if you've written gold off as a useless pet rock, fine. Revisit those thoughts. Look at look at the world through that lens there. And then if you still think it's a useless pet rock, good luck. Yeah, that that being called a gold bug is just a it's just a, it's just a shortcut, you know. It's just oh, you like gold, you must be cool. um, Guys, yeah. if if you pop up a uh, slide five, well, I, I try to make this point, like just in response to that, because you when you talk about end game uh, or what what I really think I think you're saying, and this is pretty easy to see, is is the beginning of the end is easy to see, right? Yeah. You, you get a lot of people that you know operate. I operate in this space. I'm just showing. Pretty simple uh, framework, which is a sine curve, rate of change. So there's a start of the there's there's the start of the end, and there's the beginning of a beginning. I mean, there's you, know, you just got to figure out where the hell you are. And I think that a lot of people, uh, and on the left side there, I'm, I'm just sh showing the difference in terms of thinking fractally or on, on a nonlinear basis as opposed to these linear valuation or relative value models. Um, but but at the end of the day, like it is the end. I mean, it's really easy at this point. I didn't have to write 8,000 articles on zero edge. Uh, to tell people that the, 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 the end is coming. The end of the corporate credit cycle is here. It's not a debate anymore. If, the, if, it, was, if it was a debate, uh, you know, Fink and everybody else wouldn't be panicking like they just did. Uh, but the beginning, of the, uh, the beginning of the end game, I mean, that, I think that's an entirely different discussion, and you just introduced it wonderfully. I mean, I, that, that's absolutely in play. You know, how, how could you no, not no, have no, the I beginning think... of the end game if you don't have the end of the cycle? I mean, that, 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 that's, right. that's what gives, exactly right. gives, gives birth to it. But the, but the beauty of that sine wave is it's infinite, right? It is the, it is the end, right? But that does bring a new beginning, and that sine right. wave is going to carry on forever. So, you know, people, when people hear the word end, they think of it in very finite terms, which is understandable, right? It's, it's, there aren't many more finite words than end. <laughs> but in, in, in terms of the financial cycle in terms of the monetary system you're absolutely right it's the end of something but that that by definition has to be the beginning of something else right and so people need to start thinking okay if this is the end what what's the beginning what's it it's the beginning of what well that's that in in essence i mean that's the us versus them debate and i want to bring that up and that's part of the last three days is to bubble that up and get people pissed off a little bit you gotta be a little yeah. you gotta have a little a you know, little piss and vinegar, and you got to have some passion about this. And it really does become us versus them. You know, it yeah. you you own that. That is over. I own this, and we're just getting started. You know, so to me, yeah. and that, that that to me, like, how do we get that conversation going, Grant? How how do we how do you and I have a debate with Larry and Jamie, just like this? Well, look. Uh Charlie Munger, right? I mean, it, it, he's, he's such a wise old goat, God bless him. And what he said about incentives, right? Show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. Yeah. Larry Fink and Jamie Dimon have no incentive to have that conversation because they are, they're the us, right? And they want to stay us. They don't want to be them and they don't want them to become us. So it, it's about incentives. You know, what, what you're doing is great in trying to get people engaged in, in understanding the world around them because there's a there's been a tendency over the last sort of 30 40 years as as media has exploded to 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 outsource your critical thinking and, and that's what people have done right you you don't get news anymore you get opinion everything is opinion and so when people are taking in uh, material it's generally opinion disguised as news and so they read it as fact which is what news used to be right it's opinion um what you do on Hedgeye, just having unbiased conversations with people, what, what we did at Real Vision, same thing, right? Just sit down with someone, let them talk. I don't have an agenda. I don't care if you're bullish. I don't care if you're bearish. <laughs> I just care that you're smart. Because if you're smart, I can learn from you. And the day I stop learning is the day I may as well give up. And, and people have abdicated, I think, that responsibility to themselves and their families and their portfolios to learn. And, and no one is going to learn for you. You have to be curious, you have to be inquisitive. So the us and them debate, it, it has to come from in here. And, and I think that 
what we're seeing now in terms of this massive increase in unemployment could very well be the thing that does make people start to think, well, okay, why am I out of a job? And okay, what happened? And, and once you start thinking about that, and then you start to look around at how other people are, which is perfectly natural, you'll start seeing who isn't out of a job, right? And it's not the big, it's not the, the corner shop guy, he's shut down three mm -hmm. months ago. But it's the Wall Street bankers, and it's Jamie Dimon, it's Larry Fink. These, these guys, they're not out of work, right? They're not getting laid off anytime soon. So, so, so maybe this pandemic is the beginning of that conversation. And, and then it becomes incumbent upon people like you and me and Raoul and, and all the guys who are trying to get this conversation out there to, to give people a place to go where if, if they do want to do the critical thinking and they do want to take ownership of understanding, there is at least somewhere they can go and have a chance of, of finding it. I love that. That's, I mean, again, next to uh, what you're, you're advocating here, gold, you know, long gold's one thing, long in education on why you should have been long gold is entirely another. And you, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a, great point. You, the, you know, education is an, is an interesting thing. I mean, it's something that we've, we basically, um, you know, set aside for too long. And I, and I think that people are quite willing to learn. What's interesting about Wall Street, as you know, is that everybody really wants to learn. They don't always just uh, want to acknowledge who taught them something. Um, but to have these open, these open conversations and just have the humility to listen to somebody and learn, that's, that's phenomenal. I love that. Um, we have questions, yeah. so we're going to listen to them. So, because um, again, I think that's an important part too for me is engaging. Um, with the community and a broadening community of people that really are the us in this debate. Um, yeah, sure. And a lot of your a lot of the questions are actually, and this isn't going to surprise you, like in terms of how you functionally, uh, practically think about um, building your gold position in all the different ways uh, yeah. you've considered that. Well, look, I mean, I, it's, for me, it's it's uh, I, I I think of it first and foremost as a currency, as a as a reserve currency for me, right? So. Yeah, I, if I'm going to own gold, I want to own physical gold because it's a cash reserve. It's a lot easier to move in and out of than people would have you believe, um, whether it's coins or bars stored somewhere. Uh, if you do it the right way, it's a phone call and 24 hours later, you're out of your position and the money's wired to your bank account. So if I'm going to own it um, for A, as a currency and B, for a hedge against systemic disruption, I want to own it in such a way that when I need it, it does what it's supposed to. And so for me, owning uh, gold through an ETF, and I don't want to go into all the conspiracy theories about whether the gold's there, it doesn't really matter, frankly, because at the end of the day, if you own gold as a, as a systemic risk hedge, then what a systemic risk implies is that probably stock markets are going to be closed, for example. So how do you get your gold then, right? Uh, if you own GLD and things go tits up and you want to, you want to get your gold, well, A, you need a a minimum of $100,000 to do it. B, you've got to, you've inserted at least three middlemen between you and your gold who you've got to you know, fill in forms and go to. So it, you know, first of all, own if you want to own gold, other than for price appreciation, if you just think the price is going up, you're trading it, you're not owning gold, you're owning an asset that you think you're going to make a, a turn on, which is absolutely fine. Um, if you believe that gold is going to do well in the environment that we're going into, uh, as I do, apart from protecting your purchasing power, it's going to do well, then you want to look at the mining stocks. And this is something that I have been talking about for since, um, I guess, middle towards the end, third quarter last year. Yeah, the mining stocks just look back again, look back at history, look back through previous crises, look what the mining stocks did for you. even the Great Depression, right? Well, the best performing stock was home stake mining um, by a mile. And, and, and the other way that people need to think about this, um, and I wrote about this recently, this has been the perfect example of what gold does because gold initially didn't really move much, right? It was up 1%. If we go back to February 22nd when the markets hit their peak uh, and we went to the depths uh, a couple of weeks ago, gold was up 1% at that time. People say, well, look, gold's supposed to do all, have all these fireworks. It's supposed to go crazy. It's done nothing. It's just gone sideways. Hmm. But if you, look at, if you look at what one ounce of gold would have bought you in S&P terms at the high, it was 0.49 of a unit of S&P. Two weeks later, when gold had basically gone up 1%, it bought you 33% more than it did at the peak. That's what it's there to do. It doesn't matter that the price didn't move. You could have exchanged your gold for 30% more of the S&P if that's what you'd chosen to exchange it for. Mm -hmm. so, so try and think of it not as the gold price. Oh, it's, it's 1700 it's 1750 It's going to 2000 Because when gold's at 2000 
you don't know what the world's going to look like. It's about when it is at 2000, what are the other assets that I might want to exchange it for? Yep. Gold having done its job, where are they going to be priced? Yep. So that's that's kind of the, 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 the way I think about it. Well, and people completely miss that point. You know, the, the, uh, the purchasing power, uh, the staying power, the store of value, uh, the relative purchasing power. I mean, there's so many different ways that you think about something yep. that you hold as a currency. And I think that's the most important thing that you said. Um, and that, that for me is, 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 is singing true in between my two ears. Um, another question, second highest rated question actually has to do with another asset class that um, uh, quite to the contrary has not done the same thing during recessions and depressions, which is real estate. Um, do you have an opinion on that? Because the question is, can you discuss the effects of recession, depression uh, having on, on the residential real estate market and how that demographic that we're talking about, the them, uh, is fully you know, choke full of? Well, I, the problem here again is leverage, right? I mean, if we end up in an inflationary cycle, which is, is let's face it, when we're at zero, uh, is the most likely outcome. If you're going to handicap it, we may have to go through a deflationary shock first, but inflation is ultimately the most likely outcome. Um, then we, you know, we have a problem in the, in the system. Real estate will do well in that, but it, again, it depends. Uh, it depends on where you are in the cycle and where you understand. So, you know, someone wants. So it told me an old story. I think it was Tony Dean told me a story about a guy who said uh, he was in the middle of nowhere in Ireland, funny enough. And he said, "How do I get to uh, how do I get to Dublin?" And the guy said to him, "Well, I wouldn't start from here." <laughs> and that's that, that's kind of where you are with real estate, right? If you if you if you go and buy real estate on leverage at all time high valuations, let's let's use Australia as an example, right? Perfect example of this. The property market down there is the economy, and it's. It's been fragile for a long time. The government have done everything they can to keep that bubble inflated. At some point, it's going to pop. Maybe this does it. You'll see what the Aussie government do. Everything they do will be first thrown at, first time buyer grants, mortgage relief, anything to keep that property market going. If that property has a crash and the leverage is unwound from that system, Harbourfront property in Sydney will be a fantastic asset. Yeah. You know, property in the middle of Melbourne will be a fantastic asset if you can buy it at the right price. So. Buying real estate um, is a really good idea if you can buy the right real estate, if you can buy it at the right price, and if you can buy it with the kind of leverage that is manageable and, and works for you rather than against you. And that's the trap people get into. At the end of the cycle, the leverage is working against you rather than for you. I love it. Again, that's exactly how I was taught playing Monopoly in our house. Again, as soon as, soon as I got my brother levered up, that was it. You know, goodbye Park <laughs> Avenue. Uh, it, it was, you know, that's, it's, and, and that truly is the fourth turning. I mean, I think, in, in, at least in, in one sense of the definition, which is there are a lot of people that have been conservative, that had, have a lot of gold, have a lot of cash, that didn't buy the all-time highs in ABC or didn't, uh, lever themselves up royally to buy back stock and have their airline company go kaput you know, instantaneously either. I mean, there, there are a lot of people right. that would like to own the waterfront property. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that to oh, me, yeah. that's, that's, that's a big, great part of, of free market capitalism that I still think is alive and well. Uh, this question uh, here from Brian, it kind of uh, weaves into another discussion that I had with Mike Taylor. Mike Taylor indicated that he went short-term long on Tuesday, but was expecting to adjust that position when the quarantine, uh, you know, opening up of the economy goes back to the, the coming back of the quarantine and the vaccine, or of the virus rather. Um, I thought the, I, I think, you know, what's your take on that is the question. And, and I have, I've had that question, Grant, like a thousand times it feels like in the last three days. How could you go long when you're that bearish, you know? And, and um, actually, I, right before the show, I went long. I mean, I, I go net long all the time. That's by covering your shorts and, you know, adding a couple longs. Uh, people struggle with that. They struggle with how can you maintain two opposing thoughts on two different durations and, and, and actually make money? Uh, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it, it, it's critical to be able to, to, to hold two opposing thoughts in your head. It's absolutely critical. And again, we come back, we keep coming back to that same idea, right, about, about what, you, what information you take in and how you react to it and what you write off as, a, as an impossible outcome. So, you know, I think, I think with regards what we're talking about here, being, being long in a, you know, a bear market, the first question you ask yourself is, am I looking to trade or am I looking to invest? That's the first thing you need to do in, right. in this particular instance. And I, and I spoke to Steve Diggle about this the other day because we've talked about this often. Um, you know, it, am I looking for a tactical bounce? In which case, OK, but there are ways you play that. You play it with stops. You play it so that you don't get burned if you're wrong. Right. Am I looking to invest? Well, OK, so let's look around. Let's look at 
let's look at blue chip stocks with good dividends down here that have been cut 30 40 percent is that something that i'd be happy to buy here and if i'm wrong about the bounce either add to it i'm not going to put all my money on the table now but add to it if it goes lower or hold it for 10 years because i've got a great company with a proven record with a good dividend stream yeah okay that's fine so i, I can i can buy long term in this panic if i see something that i consider valuable valuable to own over time or if i think oh the fed are going to come out and juice the markets we're going to get a quick bounce i can go tactically long for that but but i have to understand before i pull that trigger what am i trying to accomplish here and if you and if you don't understand that and you and and, and you and you don't make it clear in your own mind trades tend to become investments and once trades become investments because they went against you you're you're completely offside and and you're and you're always going to be uh, it, chasing your own tail yeah. and trying to get out of your own head. So, so to be aware of what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I, I always tell my uh, new analysts or younger analysts, just people that haven't screwed up as many times as I have. I mean, an, a long-term investor is, is often a bad trader. Um, you know, <laughs> so true. So you, so true. You, got, you just have to be willing to, to add to it and know when you're going to add to it and understand what is your timeline. Have a view on the macro cycle. That, that's actually why I started doing macro. It wasn't enough for me to answer my boss at the time, John Dawson, like when something was going against me, well, okay, well now what are we going to do, buddy? Or do you want to get fired like the rest of these? Uh, you know, it was back in 2000, 2001, so all of our tech analysts got fired, but somehow I stayed alive. Um, anyway, uh, here's another good question, and we're running out of time here. It's too bad that we are, because I could talk to you all day, man. Um, uh, this is, I haven't thought of, about this at all, and I need to. Um, from Fernando, uh, which country will be the leader in rebelling against MMT uh, policy if that is indeed what the United States decides to do? Oh boy, that's a great question. That is a great question. Which country is going to rebel against yeah. it? Yeah, who's the well, next American? No, I, 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 I don't think anyone's going to rebel against it now, right? So, so trying to work out who's going to rebel against it first, I think is looking way too far in the future. For us to get to from the point where governments are going to hand out money to people who are losing jobs hand over fist and can't pay their rent, we're a long way from people pushing back against it. Because mm -hmm. back to the them and us, right? It's yeah. the them that need the money. And it's the them that we're wondering who are going to rebel. So the them aren't going to rebel anytime soon. So I, 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 we will see this rolling wave. We're already seeing what helicopter money looks like. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get bigger. It's going to get heavier. It's going to get more thrown at it because it's going to be necessary. Only when we see the negative effects of that, are people going to start connecting the dots and saying, hey, wh why is a loaf of bread costing me 20 bucks? It, it, it takes that realization for people to start trying to connect the dots and figure out, well, hang on, why, why is inflation where it is today? So I think, I think we're so far from uh, the first country pushing back on MMT that while it's something we need to think about, I don't think it's something that is going to happen within the timeline. That means you've got to push more important decisions uh, behind it, if that makes any sense. Yep. I mean, it's a it's a good first crack at it. I love I love questions like this. I mean, you know, who you could also ask the question could have been asked another way. What's going to be known as the next free market capitalist country? I mean, um, there are a lot. You know, the, 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 there's an idealism to that, obviously, too. But I mean, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I never I, yeah, in all my, so. in all my wildest dreams. I mean, I came here in the mid '90s uh, to go to college, but I, I would have never thought that Canada would be in a tight race. With the U.S. on who is who is more left leaning, <laughs> it's not right. something no, I was expecting. So true. Uh, so true. Well, uh, and may, maybe the final question here, and this is one just you know in general, because because we've we've touched this in so many different ways. But I mean, when you think about the us versus them, or the news, like you you, you depicted what the news used to be, or what the facts are versus the opinions. If you could, if you could, and the people that you spend the most time, the people that you love and spend time with, if if you could, if you could wake up to to being better, like, and not being frustrated with all that, uh, what, what would, what would it be? What would the world look like tomorrow? Well, look, I, I think the, the the single most important thing right now is dialogue. I think if we could improve the world in one way, it would be somehow find a way for people to talk about things where they have an entrenched opinion with people who have the opposite opinion and do it respectfully. You know, I was in um, Las Vegas uh, last year and I had dinner with with some very good friends of mine. Two of them are never Trumpers and one of them 
uh, was a was a, a hugely pro-Trump guy. And we sat, and I'm the Brit, so I've got no dog in the hunt. So I, you know, I, I I was kind of being moderator and throwing questions. Just, and we had the first and only conversation I've had in the last four years about Trump as a as a man, as a president, um, that was respectful, completely in disagreement, but found places in the middle where they could actually say, okay, all right, I take your point, but. And I think until we can get back to that, until we can get back to being able to talk about, geez, a pandemic without being labeled a denier, right? Because you want to focus on data and that data doesn't represent what someone else thinks. Until we can do that, um, we're in trouble. I mean, I really think we are in trouble. So, so trying to foster dialogue that is conciliatory, that is accepting of other opinions, is will be such a great first step. And I think that will go so much further than people potentially realize. I, and that's, I, I yeah, that's, that's I, my best guess. I love that. Yeah, you because know, it's just foundationally what you do when you love and exactly. respect. You don't, I shouldn't say love, but really is. I mean, I love a lot of family members that I have that I completely disagree with. You can imagine what, I live in Connecticut. Um, you know, there are some very left-leaning views of people in my life that I love, and, and you empathize. You have a real conversation. That's why I call this actually real conversations, um, cause, yeah. because that's, you know, there's, a, there's a base level of respect, and I think that's been completely lost. But when people, totally right. when people are desperate and people don't have jobs and they, they need to find a better way, the first thing that comes back is coming together as, as human beings. So that's, I, I, I would love to see that. I mean, uh, yeah, me too. And, well, and, and I just have to say, you know, just in, certain, in conclusion, like, thanks for already doing that. I mean, you know, part of what you've already done here today and what you do every day, I mean, you know, we all have to do our part. And it's one thing to complain about it, but it's another thing to kind of be the change. And that's, um, that's something that I, I, I'm quite thankful for. And thanks for your time today. It was great. Uh, Keith, it, it was it was great, and, and thanks for you for putting this this summit on. You know, you got some great people there, and uh, and the stuff that's coming out is fantastic. And, and you know, people should watch it and listen and think about it. It's that simple. Well, we'll look forward to having you on uh, many more times to come if you're indeed game to do it. And I and I'd guess that you probably are. <laughs> Anytime, I'd love to. Great, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you very much. He's Grant Williams. That was phenomenal. That's the kind of discussion that I love having. Uh, up next, we're going to have Jeff Kleintop in about 10-15 minutes. Thanks. <laughs>